I want to thank my colleagues at the Parthenon Podcast Network for all coming together to talk about the most overlooked people in history. I had a great time hosting this episode, and we got to hear from great podcasters like Josh Cohen, host of the Eyewitness History Podcast, Scott Rank, host of History Unplugged, and Richard Lim, host of This American President. I love listening to these guys and talking to them, especially on the topic of lesser-known bits of history. Look for more of these episodes from the Parthenon Podcast Network. To see show notes and learn more about these great podcasts, go over to ParthenonPodcast.com. If you have an idea for a roundup episode, please send me an email or reach out to us on social media. You can send me an email to my email address, steve at a2zhistorypage.com or find me on social media platforms at A2Z History. I hope you enjoy this Parthenon podcast collaboration and I will talk to you soon. Welcome back to yet another Parthenon Podcast Network Roundtable event. You are going to hear some of the most exciting history podcasters on the planet share their ideas on topics of who is the most underrated person in history. And we have an exciting lineup for you. We have Josh Cohen, host of the Eyewitness History Podcast. Our fearless leader, Scott Rank, host of History Unplugged Podcast and Rounding up the roundtable, Richard Lim, host of This American History. I am your host for today, Steve Guerra, host of the History of the Papacy podcast, among others. Now, to get things rolling tonight, why don't you introduce yourself and give us an elevator speech of your podcast and tell us um, what makes someone, in at least in your estimation, before we dig in too deeply in history, underrated in your opinion maybe we'll start with richard sure and my podcast it's called this american president just to clarify Eh, so (laughs) all right yeah sure i got close (laughs) yeah very close well basically my podcast is just the outgrowth of the fact that i grew up a big history nerd when i was eight years old my mom actually before that my mom would take me to the local library and then when i was about eight I just got fascinated by presidents and have not stopped being fascinated by presidents. And I don't know how anyone can't find it fascinating. We basically give presidents a more responsibilities than any one human should ever have. And that's pretty wild. And so basically in our podcast, we talk about that. We talk about the people, very flawed human beings that served as president and all the different stories. We have different angles on these presidents and aspects of the policies that they had and their personal lives and everything. So, and you had asked about underrated, what makes a figure underrated? I mean, I guess I would say that, well, for a lot of these historic figures, there is a huge difference. Well, there's always some degree of difference between the public persona and the actual person. And oftentimes the public persona doesn't reflect the person, but it also doesn't actually reflect a reality of that person in their public office. And there are various reasons for that. Some of it is the fact that people tend to simplify historical figures, complicated ones. And so I think that as a result of that, there are a lot of people who've done things that people have no idea about. They don't know the things that they did. Or perhaps that person's mistakes have been magnified over anything else that they did in their life. You know, we tend to look at historical figures and we label them in certain ways. If you lose a presidential election, you're just a huge loser. No one thinks anything else about you. But at the same time, that person almost rose to the highest office. So I think for a lot of those reasons, because of perceptions, someone can be unappreciated. All right, Scott, what do you think? Tell us a little bit about your podcast and what qualities do you look for in somebody who's underrated? Well, I am excited because you introduced all of us as exciting and (laughs) I love me some participles. And when I get a present participle applied to me, it gives me a past participle feeling of being excited. So (laughs) having the grammar out of the way. Yeah. So my show is History Unplugged, try to make history not boring, tell some stories and, you know, do some razzmatazz, make it come alive. It, it's a really interesting question of what makes somebody underrated. And there's a lot of different ways that you can look at it. I think what I do is 
I'm always curious about how we have the histories that we do have and what makes them change over time. So we perceive the Civil War differently than people would have 50 or 100 years ago. We think of, for example, Ulysses S. Grant differently than 50 or 100 years ago. He's become much more respectful thanks to a Ron Chernow book. But in the past, histories written by Confederates would have tried to make him out for this drunkard that just threw bodies in battle. And that's how he was able to win. So I think a lot of times somebody can become underrated just because for whatever reason, the the draft of history that we currently have wants to intentionally or unintentionally mitigate someone and downplay the effects that they had. So I always think it's worse worth going back and scrutinizing the record and asking, is this or that person really as important as we think they are? Maybe they are, maybe they aren't. And I think there's a lot of people who either massively inflated or massively deflated. So yeah, that's my take on it. And then Josh, tell us a little bit about your podcast and what you look for in somebody who is underrated. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Steve. So my podcast is called Eyewitness History. And as the name would suggest, I interview and curate stories from people that were eyewitnesses to historical events. So from there, you'll find stories as varied as a Holocaust survivor. I interviewed someone who was liberated from Auschwitz. I've also interviewed more lighthearted stuff. I've interviewed Saturday Night Live writers. I interviewed the guy that wrote Chris Farley's last sketch, for instance. All of it fits under this umbrella of history. So anyone that's interested in in hearing really amazing stories from really amazing people that were there for events, definitely check out Eyewitness History. What I think makes a historical event underrated is plain and simply kind of like what Scott said, it's who history remembers or does not remember uh, value in the right way. And boy, the, the person that I have selected for our discussion, I think will fit the bill on this. I think a lot of it, one of you guys made mention about how, what the public perception is of the historical figure versus what his or her actual accomplishment was and what they actually did for history. And there can sometimes be a big gulf or a delta between the two things. You know, the the one that just immediately occurs to me is I think of like Paul Revere, whose name all of us know. And we know that primarily because of a poem by Longfellow, Paul Revere's Ride, which was something that was very popular. It still is, you know, and What a lot of people wouldn't know is that there was another writer named, I think it was Israel Bissell, who rode um, a great deal further than Paul Revere. You could argue did more, but he's not valued by history in the same way as Paul Revere is. Why? You could say in a word, marketing. So that sort of um, dichotomy I find fascinating. So yeah, that's my nutshell pitch. This is awkward because I was going to say Paul Revere was the most underrated figure in hu- in all of human history, but you just went up to me with your whatever Bissell, whatever his name is. I have two children named Paul after Paul Revere. <laughs> Darn it. Okay. Back to the drawing board. Well, shoot. Same time next week, guys. Yes. Yeah. Let's reschedule. So now here are our ground rules for tonight. Each one of you will have approximately seven-ish minutes to make the case for the person who you selected as the most underrated person in history. So I'm not nearly as tough as our old pal James Early, host of Key Battles of American History podcast, and the usual host of these episodes, but don't make me cut off your mic is what I'm saying. So let's get right to it. (laughs) And Today, I subjectively chose Richard to go first because I cannot wait to hear his case that he's going to make for Herbert Hoover, most underrated man in history. All right. Yes. So actually, I was going to introduce him as if without saying who he was, because when people immediately hear Herbert Hoover, they think of this like sour looking dude from the early 20th century. And, you know, his name kind of invokes futility, ineptitude, all that kind of stuff. But the more I studied him, the more I actually came to be impressed by him. And okay, so this is my argument. So here's a man who was born in a poor family, a poor Quaker family, had about as inauspicious a beginning as any president. He was orphaned at a young age, lost both parents at a young age, got sent off to an uncle to live there, to live with his uncle on the West Coast. He was born in Iowa. And 
went to Stanford, became a mining engineer, and this orphan, he becomes a mining engineer and he starts traveling the world. And this is in the late 19th century. And so he's going to the deserts of Australia. He's going to the jungles of Burma and he's finding mines. And this is back in the day when, you know, you could get malaria and just die. Australia was the Wild West back then. I mean, you know, if the scorpions in your shoes aren't going to kill you, someone else will. And he had a knack for finding mines. And he even went to China and he found mines there and he ended up completing what was the biggest transaction of all time in that country in China up to that point and basically became a multimillionaire. And in his early 30s was like one of the great international authorities on mining. So I forgot to mention, he also went to Stanford where he was part of their first graduating class for engineering. And so here he is like, you know, self-made man, et cetera, et cetera. He goes to the UK and he basically works for some of the top mining company, one of the top mining companies there. World War I breaks out. He knows all the businessmen in the area. A bunch of Americans are stranded in Europe and they go to the UK and they try to, you know, all the communications and all the means for travel has been commandeered for the war effort. So Hoover is the one that has to organize. He basically steps in there. He says, I'm an American. I know all the rich people here. Let me help these people out. And he starts organizing relief for these people and shelter and tickets back home. And they're like, wow, this guy's a genius organizational genius. And then Belgium gets blockaded during World War II. The Germans occupy it. The British blockade it. And so you have seven and a half million people starving. And they say, we need someone who's a good organizer to help these people. So they turn to Herbert Hoover and he organizes relief, saves millions of people's lives. And then when President Wilson needs someone to run the basically be the food czar to organize food rationing so that they can send food to the soldiers. He brings them back to America and he does that as well. And then when the war ends and Europe is decimated because of World War One, who else does the world turn to? The guy that saved the Belgians, Herbert Hoover. And he saves tens of millions of lives. Some people say he actually saved up to hundreds of millions of lives because of basically his organizational brilliance. He's a little bit of an autocrat, which works really well in crisis situations. And then when the Soviet government takes over, they experience a famine, partly because of their policies, partly because of the weather, partly because of World War I, and they ask for help. And by this time, Hoover is Secretary of Commerce. They turn to him, and he saves at least three, four million lives, Russian lives. There was a lot of controversy in this because you know, we were, Hoover was perceived as helping a communist government, but nonetheless, millions of Russians, there's actually a book that was written about it. You know, a few people know an American saved millions of Russians lives. And then this was when he was secretary of commerce. This was a time when there was the new economy, the new consumer economy, the twenties. And this is a time when there are no standard tires. There are no standards for light socket configurations. There are no standards for baby bottles. And Hoover, as Secretary of Commerce, gets everyone together, all the business leaders, and they say, let's agree. Let's agree on tire sizes, you know, electric socket configurations, and he revolutionizes the economy, standardizes it, makes it more efficient. And then a huge flood breaks out in 1927, but Herbert Hoover is sent. And before you know it, millions of Americans have food, shelter, and health care. Brilliant man. But I compare him to Bill Buckner the great baseball player of the Boston Red Sox. No one remembers that he had a really good career. They just remember his big mistake in the 1986 World Series. And that's what happened with Herbert Hoover. He was elected president. The Depression came. It was probably beyond one man's ability to solve. So he was a little unlucky. But he also made a few mistakes. And the reason is because he didn't realize the same policies that work in wartime don't necessarily work in a peacetime economy. And so, yes, he screws that up. But here's the thing. Hundreds of people are uh, hundreds of millions of people rather are alive today because of Herbert Hoover. And I think if anyone's going to tell the story of the depression, because that's all we learn, all we learn about Herbert Hoover is the depression, nothing else. But if we're ever going to learn about him, you tell the story of the depression, you tell the story of his mistakes, but you also tell the story of the hundreds of millions of people that he saved. Literally, there are hundreds of millions of people alive today because of what he did. And there's a reason he won in a landslide when he ran for president, because people saw him as a wizard. They literally thought he could engineer all of our problems away. It was 
probably way too much hope to place on one man. And even then, after his presidency, he did the big rehabilitation. He actually worked with Truman and Eisenhower. He worked with Truman to advise on reconstructing Europe after World War II. And then, you know, he was big on hydroelectric power. There's a reason that Hoover Dam's named after him. He helped Truman and Eisenhower reduce the fat in the federal government from the New Deal. And he had rehabilitated himself a lot because he died an elder statesman. He had a long retirement. So there was this long period where he was America's elder statesman. But again, no one remembers that. They just remember the Depression. So I submit to you the most underrated figure I know of, Herbert Hoover. And now a word from our sponsors. My natural question is then, how do we rehabilitate Herbert Hoover? How do you get people who have such a knee-jerk reaction that Herbert Hoover bad, uh, evil monster Herbert Hoover, into somebody who was a completely well-rounded character? I would say that getting four podcasters together to talk about (laughs) it will change it. Well, no, I, I mean, you know, it's one of those things where I don't have any illusions that we can change his reputation, just, you know, one person. But I do think that there have been new books written about Herbert Hoover that have reexamined his life and his career. There was one I read about him by Kenneth White. It was an excellent book. And, you know, maybe it's impossible to change perceptions about him. But one thing I'll say is that I think it's important. First of all, I hate presidential rankings. I hate how they simplify presidents. I think they're garbage. But with all that said, I think we should look at these figures for their whole careers, not just the presidency. Now, Scott Rank has something to say. I raised my hand in our online chat system. Yeah, I think Hoover, I'm not going to put him on my alternate Mount Rushmore. I mean, that, of course, belongs to Warren G. Harding and Rutherford B. Hayes and, you know, Millard Fillmore. Nah, John Tyler. I mean, come on. Okay. No, fair. Listeners, you're not going to know if I'm going to be serious or not. But, you know, I really do agree because I think that part of why we don't think highly of him is because we love narratives when we think of presidents. And the exact template that is used to look at the James Buchanan, Abraham Lincoln dynamic is slotted in with Herbert Hoover and FDR, that this was an incompetent president who didn't rise to the challenge of the times. And then it came a president who was willing to knuckle down and guide America through its darkest hour. And I really think that in a way, and I mean, this as a compliment that Hoover is like Jimmy Carter in the sense that for all the credit that Reagan gets for a lot of things like deregulation, much of that was started by Carter. He deregulated the telecom industry or the airline industry. And Hoover did a lot of New Deal-esque things like farm subsidy increases or broadening the federal government's ability to lend to federal infrastructure projects and more liberal lending to bail out banks and businesses. Work, works pro- work, work, work progress type of programs too. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that FDR really only continued a lot of those things. And had Hoover been president during peacetime like Eisenhower was, I think he would have been remembered like Eisenhower because Eisenhower also didn't wasn't charismatic. I think of him as a combination of a loaf of Wonder Bread and Miracle Whip, but he was a good administrator for peacetime. And I think Hoover would be remembered the same if that were his story. So yes, I like Hoover too. I just wanted to respond real quick is that, you know, I agree and I have no illusions about some of the things he did in the presidency. I do think he was miscast as a president. I mean, he was a, he had very little political skills. He was more of a technocrat, but, and so I think criticisms of him as president, there are a lot of legitimate ones, but Again, whole career, you know, for what he did. If I could go back in time, I would I wish I could go back and convince him, hey, don't run. You have such a great record. You have such a great career already. Josh, are you committed to saying that Herbert Hoover most underrated or something else? No, it's very interesting, actually. Actually, I wanted to jump in and sharpen what what Scott said. I think he hit it right on the head with the fact that Hoover was subject to a narrative because people do love narratives and people do love stories. And, you know, the word that we know from history when someone thinks about Herbert Hoover and the Depression is, of course, the term Hooverville, right? And I think that's the callback. So just like with Richard Nixon, every political wrongdoing is immediately given the suffix gate. I think the suffix gate is Hooverville for Hoover. And I think that's the story that kind of has penetrated political discourse regarding him when people assess his legacy. And then also, I had some numbers at the ready here. 
just to kind of sharpen up what you said, Richard, about his polls. So there was a 2018 poll that was done by the American Political Science Association, which ranked Hoover as the 36th best president ever. <laughs> and there was also a poll done for C-SPAN previous year, which also ranked him as the 36th ever. So just to give our listeners any sort of uh, context or texture as to what the general opinion about him might be. But you know what? Regarding his, let's call it pre-presidential career, I thought that was fascinating. The saving the lives obviously was a miracle unto itself. And I think you're right. I think the public perception of what he could do was a bit bloated by what he did accomplish. And so there were just unreasonable expectations. I think you're dead right when you say that no one person could have solved the Great Depression. You know, indeed, there are people that argue that there was a whole war that we had to go through to, to pull ourselves out of it, right? So yeah, long story short, I think I agree. I think I'll take it. There's just one last point I want to make is that, you know, when Hoover made the economy more efficient, he was really seen as the Henry Ford of government. Henry Ford had found a way to efficiently mass produce cars, and Hoover was seen as applying that to government. And it's interesting because that was like a progressive kind of idea, you know, using expertise data to do that. And then later on, he becomes kind of, you know, more on the conservative side. Once FDR becomes, you know, president, New Deal, et cetera, he starts pointing at FDR as a fascist, et cetera, et cetera. So he really kind of straddles this age of, you know, progressives who later became opponents to the New Deal, of which there were actually quite a few. Now we're moving on to Scott. Traditionally in these roundups, the people you've chosen have been responsible for the deaths of millions. Are you going to continue the streak today? Well, I have good news. I think I'm going to be able to balance out the ledger. Not only that, but put it in the black by choosing someone who saved, according to liberal estimates, 2 billion people. So my man is humble Iowa farmer by the name of Norman Borlaug who due to his ingenuity and ability to cross-pollinate wheat and make it more resilient in different climates, basically saved 2 billion people from starvation. I want to do a little bit of table setting about Borlaug and the era in which he lived. So one of the great fears of the 20th century and the conventional wisdom among the smart set is that the challenge that was going to happen and the greatest threat to global civilization was overpopulation. This goes back to Thomas Malthus, but there were books about this. If you go and watch movies from the 60s and 70s, there's Soylent Green with Charlton Heston, where future New York has 40 billion people or 40 million. There's a Star Trek original series episode about this. Dear listeners, I even purchased an episode of Captain Planet about overpopulation. And it's where one of the characters named Wheeler gets kidnapped by a race of super intelligent mice whose civilization is on the verge of collapse. It's as stupid as it sounds because of overpopulation. At the end of the episode, one of the planeteers even stares right at the camera and says, kids, when it's your turn to have a family, don't make it too big. And I thought, you're way out of your lane, Captain Planet. Tell me about jaywalking. <laughs> That's just creepy that you're talking about family planning. Anyway, but the reason that this was such a popular idea was because of a 1968 book by Paul Ehrlich called The Population Bomb. And he basically predicted charting out population growth with the ability of global agriculture to produce food that he said, the race to feed humanity is over. Hundreds of millions of people are going to die and there is nothing we can do about it. So this thinking led to China's one child policy in 1979. It led to very draconian birth control policies in many developing countries, except there's one gentleman who humbly stood up and said, I disagree. And that man's name is Norman Borlaug. So like I said, Borlaug was an Iowa farm boy. He then studied microbiology, became a crop scientist. He worked at DuPont in the 1940s to research uh, crossbreeding to make species of wheat and rice that could thrive in different environments. So in 1944, the Rockefeller Foundation sent him to Mexico to help the Ministry of Agriculture to boost wheat production. At this time, Mexico was reliant on imports and they couldn't sustain this over time. So what Borlaug did was, I mean, over the years, he does thousands, if not tens of thousands of crossbreedings of wheat. He takes advantage of the two growing seasons of the Mexican state he was working in. He uses a technique called shuttle breeding to have the same species of crop grow in different conditions to test which one is more productive. He continues to strengthen the wheat varieties through a process called dwarfing. It means shortening the stems of wheat into something shorter so it can 
handle the extra grain produced by the wheat grown in the nitrogen fertilizer that the Rockefeller Foundation also imported into Mexico and other breeding techniques I won't get into. So the results are absolutely startling. By 1956, Mexico is self-sufficient in wheat production. It doesn't have to import anything. By 1964, his semi-dwarf wheat variety is being grown in 95% of Mexican wheat fields. And Mexico has 6 x its wheat production. So instead of hanging up his hat, he decided that he would use his techniques elsewhere. India caught wind of what he had done in Mexico and requested that he visit the subcontinent to do the same thing. In the early 1960s, India and Pakistan are at war with each other, and the U.S. is sending millions of tons of grain as famine relief. And Paul Ehrlich, the population bomb author, actually used India as an example of the complete and total inevitability of famine. He said that, quote, I've yet to meet anyone familiar with the situation who thinks India will be self-sufficient in food by 1971. India couldn't possibly feed 200 million more people by 1980. Again, this is setting government policy around the world. This is what leads to the one-child policy. And for example, the health ministry of the Philippines giving cash bonuses for how many women get IUDs and stuff like that. So Borlaug comes to India with another agricultural team and there's a vigorous program to plant Borlaug's dwarf varieties of wheat. And the harvest is so high in the beginning that storage space runs out and government agencies have to use basically any building they can find to hold the harvest. Local schools are temporarily closed down to hold the grain. And these techniques are also used in Pakistan. By 1968, Pakistan is self-sufficient in wheat production. By 1974, India is self-sufficient in cereal production. So both of these nations produce wheat faster than their population growth. And their production skyrockets so much that there's about 100 million acres of land that doesn't have to be converted into farmland. And Borlaug does something similar in Ethiopia with rice in the 80s and 90s. He wins the Nobel Prize. And at the end of his life, there are criticisms of him that he basically hooked up developing nations into global agribusiness and made them dependent on fertilizers and all that stuff. And he understood those challenges and he said it wasn't perfect, but he made the point that, well, it's easy to criticize this if you're in a comfortable office in Brussels or Washington, D.C., but what would you think if you were starving to death? So he completely rejected this idea that in order to have some sort of eco-sustainable future, we have to let people starve to death. So I think as a proud Iowan, of which Hoover is also from, and Norman Borlaug, we need to have ourselves a Norman Borlaug day. Illinois has Casimir Pulaski Day, the Polish Revolutionary War hero. California has Cesar Chavez Day. I think Norman Borlaug beats them both. So we need ourselves an official state-recognized Norman Borlaug Day in Iowa. So that's my vote for someone that I think... As long as Norman Borlaug Day, if there's a Captain Planet Day, we can co-opt it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Columbus, indigenous people, you get the idea. Yeah, why can't he have his own cartoon to give creepy advice to children? And have a mullet too. <laughs> have as many kids as you need, <laughs> as you want. And eventually did people like Ehrlich see the error of their ways and nope. thank Borlaug, so that never happened. I think he's still alive. But yeah, Paul Ehrlich, he never recanted his views, even though they were demonstrably catastrophically wrong. People like Elon Musk are saying that underpopulation is a challenge, so he's meeting that by having as many kids within or outside of wedlock as he possibly can to make up the difference. Yeah. Paul Ehrlich was a proponent of what's it called? Malthusian economics, right? Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That basically, I mean, have a humane, quote unquote, humane version of population reduction, whether it's sterilization or he talked about things like having a U.S. Department of Population limitation and not having advertisements for baby cribs or portraying parenthood in a positive way. Just really weird, dude. I'm not a Ehrlich fan. I wanted to do my best to try and play devil's advocate on Borlaug. So I did some research on my own. I saw some of those same criticisms that he, you know, reaped large profits primarily for America, for the agribusiness. And I decided that all the criticism was pretty much junk. As you say, you know, if you're in a comfortable office in Brussels or wherever it is, it's easy enough to play armchair quarterback. But if you don't know where your next meal is and haven't had a meal in a day, you, you can forgive these sins very quickly. A life saved is better than, you know, you can forgive making a few bucks off of it. So I think I'll take Borlaug Day, as long as it's a federal holiday. <laughs>
Well, it's interesting you mentioned too that the problem of underdevelopment or underpopulation, oh, so many places are seeing that now where their populations are cratering. And there's once a population decline starts, it's almost impossible to turn it around. But making more food, it's obvious Borlaug showed that we can do that. Yeah, and it's not stopping. I mean, the total productivity of land per acreage is continuing to climb. If you go to a modern day farm, it's not really bumpkins and overalls that are farming. It's people that are essentially electrical engineers. They're like a combination of Tony Stark and Paul Ingalls from Little House on the Prairie and using (laughs) drone operated combines and swarm robotics in order to take pH samples from soil. So still going on. And Norman Borlaug didn't start it, but I think he perfected it. Well, he seems to have gotten some accolades, Nobel Peace Prize, as you mentioned. He's gotten Presidential Medal of Freedom. His statue is in the Capitol as one of the Iowa statues. But I think a lot of times these kind of figures, their accomplishments are so esoteric that it's people, you know, most people couldn't tell you what the what is it? The Green Revolution? That mm-hmm. That's kind of what yeah. he's kind of the main symbol of the Green Revolution. By the way, his birthday is on March 25th. So if there's going to be a Borlaug Day, that's the day. Yeah, he's not really crowding out any other holidays and maybe Easter, depending on when it falls. But yeah, you make the point that in one way, it's easy to overlook him because he wasn't a military hero. He wasn't the founder of a nation. These people, the Hegelian idea of the movers of history are typically revolutionaries or military leaders or whatnot. Being a crop scientist, that really doesn't fit the mold of that. So I think because of how we understand influential people, he doesn't fit into those categories. So that's what makes him so easy to overlook, despite what I believe is his substantial influence. Well, he also shares a birthday with Danica Patrick, so he might have some (laughs) competition there. Just throwing it out there. The lady NASCAR driver? Yeah. yeah. Okay. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I can't compete with that. I okay. Yeah. I rescind my offer then. <laughs> and WNBA superstar Cheryl swoops. So, they, you know, anyways, you can see why he's underrated now. Yeah. yeah, <laughs> right? yeah. Are you on the female sports Wikipedia page right now? Or <laughs> oh, and Sarah Jessica Parker shares a birthday. Oh, it just keeps getting worse for him. I'm just wasting airtime now. Anyways, it's getting worse and worse. <laughs> it is. And now a word from our sponsors, Josh. You have a person who is almost certainly not a name that's likely to come up in your dinner conversation tomorrow, (laughs) but he really should. Let's hear about Stanislav Petrov. Stanislav Petrov, yeah, I was going to say, so the figure Scott hit was Borlaug saved 2 billion people. I may just be able to beat that. I'll give it my best shot. So Stanislav Petrov should be one of, if not the most famous person in all of human history, not American history, world human history. And he's basically unknown, as you allude to, Steve. You know, So he was a lieutenant colonel in the Soviet Air Defense Forces, who's widely believed to have been single-handedly almost entirely responsible for the fact that we didn't have a World War III in, back in the year 1983. So just setting the table here, so this was at the height of the Cold War. Okay, The Soviet Union had just mistaken a Korean passenger a Korean passenger jet, that which was Flight 7 for a spy plane, and shot it down after it strayed into Siberian airspace. And the US and our allies, we were, you know, rightfully outraged over this. So everyone was on kind of high alert. Both the US and the Soviet Union had performed multiple nuclear tests that month. So everyone was sort of was tense, to put it mildly. So it was in this context that Soviet radar reported that the U.S. had launched five ICBMs, intercontinental ballistic missiles, at targets within the Soviet Union. And this data was checked and rechecked, and there was apparently no sign that they were in error. And Stanislav Petrov was at the helm. So he didn't have the authority to launch a retaliatory strike. His responsibility was to pass the information up through the chain of command. But it's widely believed that given the protocols in place, had he passed that information along, we would have seen a massive retaliatory strike against the United States, which would have been more or less guaranteed at that point. And of course, upon seeing those incoming missiles, there would have been a strike of our own, where the United States would have launched hundreds, if not thousands of missiles over to the Soviet Union. And then it would have been game over. That would have been hundreds of millions of people 
that would have died more or less immediately. Now, happily, Petrov declined to, to pass the information along. And there's a human element here that I think transcends machinery and technology that I just I kind of want to plant a flag on. So his decision boiled down to mere intuition, right? The protocol demanded that he pass the information along because it showed every sign of being a real attack, especially given the, the tense situation that I mentioned. But Petrov reasoned that if the United States was going to launch a real, true nuclear first strike, they would have done it with more than five missiles. Five missiles doesn't really make a lot of sense. But it's also believed that any of the other people who could have been on duty that night instead of Petrov would almost certainly have passed the information up the chain of command, killing a few hundred million people and thereby wiping out both the United States and Russia. Now, just for good measure, our retaliatory strike, the United States retaliatory strike protocol at the time entailed wiping out Eastern Europe and China for good measure. So I just want that to kind of land for a moment, right? This could well have ended human civilization, certainly the world as we knew it or know it now. And just to sort of maybe give some texture to the fact that it was in the year 1983, not ancient history by any means. And one way to remember this, Steve, I did this just for you as the host of Beyond the Big Screen. I pulled a list of all the movies that were released in the year 1983. So just to throw that out there, we had Return of the Jedi, Terms of Endearment, Flashdance, Trading Places, Risky Business, The Big Chill, Breathless. Scarface, Rumblefish, and The Outsiders. Don't forget Superman 3 with Richard Pryor. <laughs> I was hoping to skip merrily over Superman 3 and Silkwood. <laughs> Not as bad as Superman 4. The first two are great, though. Anyways. But it's amazing to think about that those could have been the last films ever made. Now, ironically, because we all know that history loves its irony, right? War Games and The Day After were also made that year. And those are, of course, both films that encapsulated this, you know, overarching concern about nuclear war. So. So we could have been spared. We could have been spared Battlefield Earth. We could have been spared Battlefield Earth. And Jiggly. Is it worth a nuclear holocaust? We leave the listeners to decide that question for themselves. We'll leave a poll up. <laughs> right. But Scott, Steve, Richard, submitted for your consideration. I give you Stanislav Petrov. Was there something in Stanislav Petrov's background or in his character that would have said that he would have bucked Soviet Russia and being sent to the gulag and everything to use his own sense? Nothing that I could find. And I strongly, strongly suspect that if there was such a character trait that could be discerned from his background, he would not have been with the Soviet military. Yeah, that's a good point. When I saw that you mentioned him, it really got me thinking about nuclear deterrence. And I mean, I'm not an expert on 20th century history and the Cold War and nuclear standoffs and whatnot, but I did uh, look up other close calls like this. And unfortunately, there's just a lot of them. So I saw that during the Cuban Missile Crisis, there was a NORAD center in Minnesota called the Duluth Sector Direction, and guards saw that there was a figure who had entered the perimeter, they worried it was a Soviet saboteur. So pilots were ordered to their nuclear armed interceptors and they were taxiing down the runway and they determined that it was a false alarm. It was actually a bear that had breached the perimeter. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that says, wow, we had a lot of near misses, so how are we not all dead? Or if it says the doctrine of mutually assured destruction works so well that people don't push the button unless they're 200% sure. Not exactly sure, but another thing that made me think about this discussion is as archives open up and things are declassified about heads of state of the 20th century, it really makes me wonder, when we look back at this time period, was nuclear war a great triumph of the global diplomatic arena, or was it just something that by pure dumb luck we managed to avoid? And I heard some people mention after the passing of Queen Elizabeth II that she, more than anyone else, really wielded soft power. She was able to bring heads of state together. And it was people like her that created institutions and had heads of state meet with each other to avoid these types of standoff. Or maybe we could credit someone like Mikhail Gorbachev, who allowed the Soviet Union to peacefully collapse and not have nuclear warheads end up in a bunch of rogue actors. 
I don't know. I mean, that's a maybe there's a lot that we don't know about this period, but it made me wonder if it is, you know, a lot of incidents like this were just due to nothing but dumb luck. We didn't all get nuked. I think honestly, it, a lot of it does have to do with dumb luck. It, it's all chronicled in this amazing book called The Bomb by Fred Kaplan. He goes into all, if you guys just want to really depress yourselves on a Friday night, you got nothing better to do. He chronicles all those events, like the ones I mentioned, the one you mentioned. There was also one in 1960 where U.S. radar equipment in Greenland, basically the same thing, where it looked like there was going to be a nuclear strike coming in. And it looked like, I guess, that their system actually picked up uh, northern lights <laughs> in the sky. Supposedly, the chemicals, you know, somehow interfered with the system and gave a false positive. So how much of this really does boil down to dumb luck? It gets depressing. Richard. So do you think underrated or just dumb luck? Well, I, I think it's easy to kind of forget that while there were a lot of near misses that required people to make specific decisions at the same time, I mean, the, the point of nuclear weapons, I was reading like a, a study on nuclear weapons and it basically said the whole point of nuclear weapons existing now is to make sure they're never used. And so it's just pure deterrent. And I think you can't, it's hard to eliminate the fact that, you know, some people do statistics and they say countries that actually have nuclear weapons tend to be less aggressive because they've joined this club, which therefore puts them basically on a level of nations that, well, if they ever act with nuclear weapons, they risk their own existence. You know, another country will. So I think it's important to also know that in terms of the nuclear infrastructure, you know, those things are all designed to create a deterrent. But even within that truth, while nations might have an incentive, therefore, to not attack each other, it's still possible that miscalculations happen. I mean, wars start because of miscalculations. So I think that's a factor, too. I don't know. I guess I'm hedging on that. I guess it's a little bit of both, in my opinion. I think I agree mostly. I guess the way I would probably complicate it, I think I know what you mean, is most people would acquire the nuclear weapons not wanting to use them, making it a last ditch effort and only as a retaliation. But then, you know, you'll unquestionably have a group of people that will want to acquire nuclear weapons for the sole purpose of creating destruction. We all know, you know, Saddam Hussein and WMDs was ultimately debunked, but you get my point. Yeah. Well, the other thing I was going to say, so just to play devil's advocate here. So I think that the impact that he had is, you know, arguably immense and profound, but you could argue that I think when you look at someone who's underrated, you're kind of looking more totality of career as opposed to one specific moment. And that one specific moment is a very important moment. But anyways, just to put it out there, because I think when I look at another figure where you look at the totalitarian, you know, the, the totality of their career, you can say, oh, well, altogether, it wasn't just this one moment, but it was kind of sustained excellence that's ignored. So just the thought. Doesn't mean I'm right. That's kind of an interesting way to wrap it all up and put it all together. I mean, the definition of an underrated person, is it the totality of their career and a set of, or can it just be the person who is in the right place at the right time, but just doesn't get recognized for it? Israel Putnam doesn't get a song about it or a poem written about him, even though Arguably, what he did was more important for American history than the great ride of Paul Revere. Oh, Israel Bissell. Or Bissell, sorry. Israel Putnam sounds like a Revolutionary War guy, too. Yeah, he was a general. Yeah. <laughs> Israel Putnam. Oh, is, Israel Bissell sounds like a Jewish vacuum cleaner. So. <laughs> oh. Israeli NBA. Or no, I was going to say a WNBA Israeli star. I don't know. Anyways. <laughs> Well, I think, you know what, I really want to thank Scott, Josh, and Richard for joining us today on this Parthenon Podcast Network Roundup on the most underrated people in history. I think we all know who won, or do we? The, the only way that we will know <laughs> yeah, is who the most underrated person in history is for you to let us know. So reach out to us by email, social media, or any other way to let us know what you think. You can find us on ParthenonPodcast.com or at our individual websites, all of which will be in the show notes or found at ParthenonPodcast.com. Thank you, of course, for listening, and we will talk to you soon on the next Parthenon Podcast History Podcast Roundup.